<laughs> well, good morning, DSM. I know that countdown was a little weird. Um, I'm actually not live right now. It's 8.05 at the time I'm filming this. We've been having internet problems at my house. Of course, you know what I'm saying? We've been doing so well. We've only had one internet problem since we've been in quarantine during a live stream, but I wasn't comfortable to go live today just because it's been crashing every couple minutes. So I figured it'd be best to upload this and let's just treat it like a live. Let's pretend um, that I'm talking to you live in person. I'm gonna be in the chat. The chat will be going. Um, today's gonna look a little bit different in honor of Mother's Day. We won't be doing small group. I'm gonna try to keep my message on the shorter side so that you guys can go celebrate together. Um, but as you might have seen from the title, this message is called my normal average regular family which if you're anything like me none of those words actually describe my family um we are far from normal anything but average and there's not a singular regular part about us and i'm imagining you guys are pretty similar um and so today we're actually going to do something a little bit different than our messages have been uh we're going to be diving back to the very very first family that ever existed and we're going to be looking at what they did right and maybe more importantly what they did wrong um but first i want to ask and i know this is not live but i do want to ask and i'll be engaging in the comments um as we do this i need to know what does like a normal family look like because to me there are a couple like prototypical family modules that none of which are normal like the four on the screen like you have the not so normal family and this might be you your family is strange to say the least and, and sometimes you wish your family looked more like other families or maybe your family actually is kind of normal and you got a little you're a little quirky you guys are kind of just a little weird but maybe you love that and maybe that's something that you cherish about or you wish maybe they were less eccentric sometimes uh, or maybe you have too normal of a family and <laughs> and sometimes you just wish something would happen you you are just like this is the most boring house how are we i'm not gonna speak for you <laughs> or maybe your family looks normal on the outside but anyone who's living in the house knows that there's some real stuff going behind the scenes whatever your family looks like i i think it's safe to say that uh what does a normal family look like um Nobody has a normal family. There's no such thing as a normal family. And this reflects the TV we watch, you know what I'm saying? Um, in a live stream we did earlier in this week, if you missed it, hit the little bell button. I feel like a YouTuber. Hit the bell button to know that we go live. Um, we asked, I asked for some examples of crazy families on TV. Uh, we got everything from Good Luck Charlie to The Incredibles to The Kardashians to The Addams Family. We know that normal is not very entertaining to watch. Unfortunately, normal is hope is kind of what we crave. Normal might not be fun to watch, but it's a lot better to live sometimes. Um, and I know that for you watching this right now, you might be wishing that your family was a little bit no, uh, a little bit more normal. But as I think we can all agree, there's nobody out there with a normal family. Uh, for instance, my family is far from normal. My mom is probably in the chat right now. Happy Mother's Day, mom. Love you. We're not normal. <laughs> we are a very eccentric group of people. Um, me, my brother, my mom, my dad. We are a very diverse group of people. <laughs> and, and sometimes um, we know exactly how to get under each other's skin. And maybe, maybe you've had some thoughts that I've had growing up. Um, I've definitely had the thought of my family is so dysfunctional <laughs> or or maybe you've thought that your family does not understand you they just don't get you or what you do or what you believe or maybe you've had a thought that i think we've all had as, as a kid uh, and you just looked at your family and wished that there were any other people in the room and you just wish you had a different family here's what i'm going to say that's going to challenge you you might not believe this you might not agree with this but here's what i'm going with today God can use your family, yes, you heard me right, your family, to do great things. And I know um, if this was a conversation, if this was just me and you talking, you might look at me and say, Nick, you don't know my family. <laughs> and you're right. I don't know your family, but I do know God. And while you're right, I don't know 
exactly what's wrong with your your family or why your family is so strange or or some of the problems you've had uh, some more serious than others i know god and i know god can do great things through your family and so what we're going to do today is we're going to do a lot of reading and if you're a history fan you're going to love today um i unfortunately am not a history fan um it's just not my favorite subject but i will even say and i'll admit this what we're reading today is fascinating and now naturally i'm not someone who does a lot of old testament studying i like to read the new testament of the bible um which is the part when jesus was here and after that but even i um who is you can ask any of my history teachers did not show much interest in the subject can find something fascinating about what we're reading today so in the very first book of the bible genesis 1 we look at god creating pretty much everything we had nothing and then we had the planet and all of the things that inhabited but starting in chapter two where we're gonna start we're gonna look at god creating the very first person up until this moment there was no persons there's no people there was no human beings on this planet but in verse seven and i believe it's gonna pop up on the screen yep there we go um chapter two of genesis verse seven and we're gonna skim through verse uh chapter two and three right now in verse seven it says then the lord god formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being if that's your first Bible verse, I'm sorry. That's a weird thing to read. That's just a not normal sentence. Um, and I, I love that the very first family started in the least normal way possible, that through the dust and God breathed through his nose and then a man existed. There's something fascinating to me about that kind of a thing. Um, but then um, we see that God created Eve, Adam's wife. So we have Adam and Eve now. And essentially, they God told these two people like, dude, this whole garden that you live in, all of it's yours. You can like, you can name all the animals. There's so many fun foods to eat. But wait. The Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So God's going on like from from all of these verses leading into this verse, God's telling them about all the fun things that they can do. And then he's like, wait, up, 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 up. there's one rule. I love that he didn't give this long terms and conditions list that we always have to like pretend that we read. He literally is like, listen, just don't eat that fruit from that tree. Or when you eat it, you will certainly die. Pretty high stakes seem like seems like a pretty fair deal if i just like got spawned into this amazing garden um and god's like welcome yo check out all those cool look at how many animals you know what i'm saying and god's throwing me this huge party he's like well hey just that tree over there don't eat from that tree or else you'll die and ruin everything um, <laughs> which maybe god didn't say ruin everything but when you say certainly will die there's an implication that that ruins everything but we're going to skip ahead to chapter three now. We're going to start in verse six. And it says, when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was also good for food and was pleasing to the eye as a really attractive fruit, <laughs> she took some and she ate it. And, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he also ate it. Let me get this straight. The one thing they weren't supposed to do, they did. And if you've grown up in the church, you know this story. Even if you don't grow up in the church, you know this story. But I still think it's fascinating that these two people had it all, and yet they elected to do the one thing they weren't supposed to do. And if you haven't heard this story, there's a snake that talks to them and tempts them. Crazy. I highly recommend at some point today, I know it's Mother's Day, but open your Bible and read Genesis chapter 3 and just read about the weirdness of this scenario. Um, but then... When they ate it, everything changed. Everything changed immediately. They looked at themselves and they're like, oh shoot, we're naked. And they tried to cover themselves up. Shame had entered the world. Guilt had entered the world. Uh, if you know me, I love that word guilt. It's the best word of all time. Sorry that you had to hear that. But everything changed. And then all of a sudden in verse nine, it says the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And I love this because God knows where Adam is. It's not like God's like, Adam's like in a really good hiding spot. And God's like, wait, what, where did, where did I put my keys? Where did I put my Adam? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, God knows where he is, but he calls them and says, where are you? And, and a couple verses later, it's amazing because Adam does what every man does and says, uh, the woman you put here with me, she did it. She gave me the fruit and I ate it. <laughs> I love that he has to still stay. And then I ate it. It's not like she ate it. Don't punish me. She did it. And then I did. 
<laughs> and he tries to pass the blame. And this is the very first instance of blame. A and we're seeing all of these sin and all of these awful things start to exist because they disobeyed God. This perfect family is no longer so perfect. In fact, they're the least perfect people that have ever existed in this sense because they had everything and now they've ruined it all. And unfortunately, moving after this and uh, uh, into this next bigger section of this verse, um, the Lord breaks down kind of the repercussions of their actions because they don't die on the spot. They don't die if you're waiting for them to fall down dead. That's not what happens. It says to the woman, he said, I'm going to make pains in your childbearing very severe. All of a sudden, when you're pregnant, it hurts. That's what the Lord said. That's going to happen to you now. Uh, and you will desire for your husband. Uh, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And, and, and now in this next verse, and unfortunately I don't have it on the screen, but it actually might be for your best. He says this to Adam. <laughs> he says to Adam, uh, because you listened to your wife and you ate the fruit of the tree, which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Can you imagine God saying cursed because of you? Uh, it just gives me chills. Uh, through painful toil, you will eat the food from it all of your days. Uh, it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the fields. Uh, and by the sweat of your brow, you will eat food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. And all of a sudden, God is looking at Adam and Eve and saying, your life is going to be really hard. And everyone that comes after you, their life is going to be hard now because you guys did this. And then in verse 23, um, the Lord, um, it says right here, the Lord God banished them um, from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Uh, and what this means is that one day you're going to die and now you have to work. You didn't have to work before, dude. Everything was good. And, and so this family is paying this ultimate consequence for their sin. Their whole world and every world, everyone's world following those two is going to be difficult. It's going to be filled with sin. It's going to be filled with hate. It's going to be filled with disease and evil and hard work and things that just don't feel fair because of their actions. And, and, and now it might be, you might look at this and think my family isn't that bad. <laughs> Maybe this is a positive thing because you're like, at least my mom never did that. At least my mom never cursed the entire earth forever. <laughs> but you might be thinking, Nick, what, what's the point of this story? That's a cool, fun Bible history fact. But what does that have to do with my regular, normal family? Well, I'll say this. Despite their mistakes, God did not leave this family hopeless. And you might be thinking, this is about as hopeless as it gets. They're dying now. <laughs> But despite their mistake, God didn't leave their family hopeless. And, and the way I know this is that their story doesn't end there. This isn't the end of the Bible. The Bible didn't say, all right, well, then there was sin. Best of luck, you middle schooler who lives in Simi Valley. You know what I'm saying? That's not how the Bible ends. The story continues. And we're actually going to read a little bit more. I'm sorry if you're bored of reading. I promise this is going to get back to your family soon. But I, I think it's just so val uh, valuable for you to hear this origin story when it comes to family um and, and we're gonna start in chapter four and it says uh, she it's referring to eve uh she became pregnant with and gave birth to cain uh, and she said with the help of the lord i have brought forth a man later she gave birth to his brother abel and now abel kept the flocks and, and, and cain worked the soil which what this is saying is that Abel's job was to manage all the sheep. I don't know. Manage might have been the wrong word. Uh, his job was to oversee the animals. And then Cain's job was to farm, like do the vegetation and fruits. I don't know. Wheat and pumpkins. I don't, I'm just thinking Minecraft. Um, and, and, and now they were asked to give a sacrifice to God. And you have Cain and Abel. And now Abel is like, you know what? I love God. I'm going to give God my best animal. I'm just going to pick like my best animal. And I'm going to kill this animal for God. And Cain's like, I give him some rotten fruit. <laughs> Maybe not literally rotten fruit. Go read the chapter. But Cain's sacrifice to the Lord was nothing compared to what his brother Abel did. And then what ends up happening is God really rewards Abel and says, Cain, you dropped the ball. That was kind of messed up of you, dude. 
You should have given me a better sacrifice. And then Cain's like, hey, Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field hanging out, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. All <laughs> I've never, I've never been that mad at my brother. I've it, maybe when I was a kid, I'm like, I'm gonna kill you, but I've never been that mad at my brother. Ever, I don't, I don't. I hope that none of you have ever been that mad at your sibling or your parents before. He literally killed his brother, and you had this, and you have to think this family was so close to being perfect. All they had to do is not eat from the fruit, and then all of a sudden there's a curse on the entire planet because of Adam and Eve, and now their son, their first two sons, uh, uh, assume their first two sons, these brothers, one of them kills the other one. Talk about a non-regular, abnormal family. Um, and, and then I love exactly what happens next because God says to Cain, where's your brother Abel? And it's so amazing that God says the same thing that his dad, God says the same thing to Cain's dad and is like, where are you, Adam? Even though he knows, he knows what happened. But I love this. Cain tries to lie. He's like, I don't know. <laughs> I love that. Like he just murdered his brother and God himself is saying, dude, what'd you do? And he's like, oh, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to, am all am I Mr. Watch my brother? <laughs> He's lying to God. And, and then a couple verses later, it says, listen, because of what you just did, when you work the ground, it, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You're not going to be able to do the thing that you do. You harvest vegetation. You're a farmer kind of guy. You don't get to do that anymore. Every time you try, you will not get any food. And, and in fact, actually, I'm going to send you out and you're going to be a restless wanderer on the earth. You are going to just wander the earth from here on out. Um, and there's something so tragic about that. And in the next couple of verses, Cain's like crying to the Lord, like that's too much. Like that's too big of a punishment, dude. Like scale it back a little bit. Like I can't handle that. When people see me, they're just going to kill me. If they know what I did, they're going to kill me. And I love what God says. He's like, no, 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 no. A anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. What if you kill him? Seven times worse will things happen to you. And then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that anyone who found him would not kill him. <laughs> okay. Okay, Cain was so hurt. He was so full of anger that he literally killed his own brother. And then he lied about it. I don't think any of you have come to that extreme. But what I think is fascinating is that is a trait that we all have. We get caught in our things and we know we do something wrong. We say something inappropriate to our parents and we say something we shouldn't have said or we, we do something mean to our siblings and then we get caught and we're like, oh, I didn't do that. Oh, oh it. Even though he had to pay these ultimate consequences of being banished and, and wandering and not having food. You're not gonna believe me here. <laughs> But I still believe, despite his mistakes, God did not leave Cain hopeless. Let's let's just look again at, at God's response to Cain, because it's pretty similar to God's response to his parents. Uh, God was grieved by Cain's actions, and there were serious consequences, but God still took care of him. And Cain, if you continue reading in this chapter, went on to go build an entire city. And in fact, the rest of chapter four is what we call a genealogy, which a genealogy is is potentially something very boring to a lot of people. It's a family tree. So you have Adam and Eve gave birth to Cain and Abel, and then Cain killed Abel, and then Cain had uh, this family, and this family had this family. And it's literally, if you go read chapter four, it's fascinating. It's just names, names that you've probably never heard before. They're very Old Testament Bible names, but it's fascinating to look at. And, and I believe, that you're looking at someone like Cain, and potentially if you put yourself in Cain's shoes, you would probably think the same thing. When this family, your family, it had so much potential. But it very quickly, your family might feel like a story of failure, or betrayal, or jealousy, or anger, or tragedy. And, and, and when, when your family has this kind of history, you might think about your own family, and you might think, what good could possibly ever come from my family? What good could ever escape this cycle of sin and violence? Uh, what good could God ever do to redeem my family? Because I know Cain was thinking the same thing. And I, honestly, you might be thinking the same thing about Cain's family because you might not actually realize what's about to happen. I believe, 
Uh, and you might disagree with me up until the very last second, and you might never agree with me on this, but I believe their story is greater than their worst moments, and I believe the same thing to be true about your family today. So in chapter four, we look at this genealogy, and I'm not going to make you read it, but if you follow the genealogy uh, of Cain's city that he starts and the families he starts and the families that they start, what you're going to end up with is the birth of Jesus. And now that might not be significant to some of you, but to just pause and think for a second that the family that ruined everything, that the, the, the beginning family, the first family that caused this world to be filled with sin, and, and, and the family that siblings murdered each other, that's the family tree in which Jesus came from. And I love Jesus' family tree because it's full of sinners. I wish we could spend an entire series talking about all of the sinners that paved the way for Jesus to be born and to save us. Because it's, it's a tragedy. It's just, it's horrible people after horrible people who made wretched mistakes. But God was able to create a greater story than their worst moments. And I believe the same God will do something amazing for your family. I don't know your family. I don't know the extent that they've hurt you or they've hurt each other. I don't. But I know that if Jesus can come from a long line of sinners, God can do something amazing through your family tree. And now, there's so much I want to talk about, but for just the sake of time, and I want you guys to go spend time with this crazy family we're talking about, um, I'm, I'm going to kind of make um make our way through some of these things that i wanted to say despite our mistakes god doesn't leave our families hopeless i truly believe that um okay we're gonna ask this question in just a second i'm gonna leave it up on the screen because i want you to start thinking about it but here's what i say here's what i truly i truly believe now that we know about the imperfect family that started everything that has led that has started all that we that we know including Jesus. I want us to really reflect on our own families. And, and this might be a bittersweet moment for some of you because there might be more bitter than sweet. Um, and hopefully this isn't an exercise that hurts you more than it helps you. But truly, I want you to start to think about what feels imperfect about your family. Because it might be your family structure. Maybe you have too many parent figures or not enough parent figures. There's a couple too many, you feel like you have a couple too many steps or not enough parents in the picture. Maybe there's one too many brothers or sisters in the house that you live in. Maybe it's your family's dynamics. Maybe you feel like the relationships in your home are too loud or too quiet. Uh, they're too aggressive or, or too passive. Uh, maybe you feel like things are too tense or too distant. Maybe it's your family's situation. Maybe you feel like the rules your family lives by or your living situation, your finances, your health. Maybe your safety aren't what they could have been or what you wish that they were. Maybe it's a tragic moment in your family's past. Maybe there's loss or there's loss or pain um, that still hurts your family right now. Maybe it's your family's faith. Maybe you feel alone in your faith or you're the only one in your family who doesn't have faith it's important for you to acknowledge the things that hurt you but more so than that i don't want this to be the end of the message because here's where all of this matters here's where learning about our origin story matters so much here's where learning about the least perfect family matters because like these imperfect families that we just read about it's time for you to start to think of where God has been good to your family. The things God was able to do for your family, even when it seemed like all hope was lost. Maybe, maybe there's been more healing happening in your family than you realized. Maybe a family member has transformed in ways that you never thought they could. Maybe a family member has stepped up in ways that you didn't think that they ever would be able to. Maybe you've been shown love in seasons where you didn't deserve it. Maybe you've been able to bond with a sibling over a similar experience. Um, I, I want you to think about the times that 
your family needed help and God was able to provide. Because I know it doesn't always happen. I know for some of you, you're thinking, Nick, I can't think of one. And I hope that we have the chance to talk about that. But this might be uncomfortable for you, but I'm going to encourage you to pray. To pray for your family and to pray for God's help. All throughout the Bible, we see people cry out to God and have these conversations with God. And I believe that can still happen today. If your family situation is hurting, I believe you can reach out to God and, and ask him uh, to, to step into your family situation. Um, and I truly believe this. And this, this is something that matters a lot. And I need you to hear me. Your job is not to fix your family. But you're a huge part of your family's story. You're a huge part of your family's story. You need to hear me. Your job as a, as a child in the household, even if you're almost 18, your role as a child in the household is not to fix your family. That's not your responsibility. But God can use you to make a huge difference in your family tree. Maybe for generation after generation, your family has been plagued by something awful that just is hurting family after family your all your cousins are this way all your aunts and uncles are this way maybe god is calling you to be the first person to be different maybe god has put you into this messy story for you to make a difference in a lineage that will last generations maybe that's what god's brought you here for just like adam and eve had had two had these two kids to start cain and abel even though Cain made this horrendous mistake, Cain went on to create the city that will that creates the families that goes throughout this whole genealogy that leads to the birth of Jesus. You don't know what God has in store for you in this story. You don't. But I truly believe that God can use your family. I do I believe it. I believe that God uses our hard situations. Um, for something bigger than we realize. And you might not realize what you were used for until you have kids of your own one day. But I truly believe God can use your family. And today on a day like Mother's Day, which can be hard for some of you, or you might not have a great relationship with your mom or, or the what a mom looks like in your house just might not be conventional. I want you to think of what your family could be and what God can do through your family. And maybe... Maybe it's not your whole family. Maybe that person in your family just doesn't change. Maybe your sister never does what they're supposed to. Maybe your stepdad never changes the way they promised they would. But what God can do through your family, including you. I hope, I hope this message challenges you. I hope this message inspires you to know that you might be the thing that God put on this planet for a very specific reason, that God is going to use you to do something incredible for generations. I hope that's encouraging. I hope it's encouraging to hear that even though families in the, from the beginning of time have made mistakes, God's been able to do amazing things through them and create healthy marriages out of, out of complete problems of blame and jealousy, that families were able to start after, after terrible things like murder and betrayal happen. I hope you feel encouraged that your family may still change even if you don't feel like they might. I believe God can use your family, and I don't think that there's a family too simple or too complex for God to fix. Um, I'm going to pray real quick. We're not doing small groups today. Um, so you guys are dismissed to go right after this to go hang out with your family and have a great Mother's Day. Um, but let, let me pray for your family right now. Lord, what a hard conversation for us to have. Thank you for challenging us with this. Thank you for giving us something hard to talk about. Thank you for challenging us in this way that it, it changes the way we view our family, our parents, our siblings. Lord, thank you for even though they betrayed you, Lord, Adam and Eve, thank you so much for, for them s s proving that you can still use broken people. Thank you for sending your son through a lineage of horrible, broken, messed up families. Thank you that your son, who is a perfect man, who died for our sins, was able to come through all of that. I ask you to give us the confidence to know that you're doing something in our families, and it may just start with us. I ask you to instill confidence in someone hearing this right now, Lord. I, I, I hope you can instill confidence in someone who's praying right now to do something miraculous and change the family lineage. 
Lord, you're a good God. We're so thankful for you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys are awesome. I hope you have the best Mother's Day. I know this was kind of, might have felt like a little bit more of a bummer than anything else, but I hope you know that no matter what your family looks like, one, you always have a place to talk about it here at DSM, and two, that we believe that God can still use your family. You're awesome. Have a great rest of your day.